Good morning, everyone. So good to see everyone here on the third day, still fighting for internet governance. Always good to see. Um, is this transcript working just fine? Uh, perfect, it is. Well, I would like first to thank everyone who made an effort to be here on this panel. It's not easy to assemble um, such a diverse uh, panel and, and it's a great pleasure to have all, all of them here. This is a exploratory session. We want to have a discussion and more than anything see where we are coming from. So where are the positions of the BRIC countries coming from? We want to have that sort of discussion so that we can try to better understand each other. And the way we'll do this, we'll go about first doing individual expositions, small ones, in which we'll just, you know, discuss a little bit about our views on the sovereignty and the, the internal policies of the countries. And at a second moment, we will have a debate about what we feel is the future of our cyber presence. Um, so this will be fairly structured in that way, but at the same time, we would like to invite in the debate portion, uh, your participation, it's very welcome. So without further ado, I would like to um, have as our first speaker, um, Dr. Luca Belli. He is a professor of internet governance and regulation at Fundação Getúlio Vargas Law School. It's a, a very prestigious institution from Brazil. And he also is starting a BRICS project right now. And if he wants to put in a little word about that before his exposition, it would be a great pleasure to hear about it. Please, Dr. Belli. Thank you very much, Mark, for organizing this panel so well, and also for choosing this very timely uh, topic. Uh, I think it's uh, very interesting to see, also politically speaking, globally, uh, what has been the evolution of the very first decade of the BRICS and what could be uh, the evolution of the BRICS. Uh, in the next decade. Uh, I, that is one of the reasons actually why we, we decided to start this project called Cyber Bricks. Uh, if you are on Twitter and you look for the hashtag Cyber Bricks, you also will also tr find out that we have a uh, call for applications for uh, researchers. So I'm hiring five researchers, one per brick country, uh, to uh, assess data protection and cybersecurity frameworks in the BRICS, which are some of the most uh, important uh, topics in the political agenda, not only in the political agenda of the BRICS, uh, but also for the development of uh, e-commerce and uh, trade between BRICS. And also most of them have been either uh, studying or approving uh, legislation in data protection over the past couple of years. Uh, and the cybersecurity is not only a, a threat, but also a national product for the majority of them. So, for instance, if we uh, take the case of Brazil, Brazil actually is very interesting because it's, uh, I think, the only country in the world where the, the, the number of victims is as high as the number of attackers. So it's usually you either have a lot of attacks coming from a country or targeting a country, Brazil is super interesting because it's the only country in the world where you have both a lot of attackers and a lot of victims. And uh, I think this is uh, primarily due to the fact that Brazilians are, uh, have adopted a lot of uh, digital technology, but still uh, literacy level and digital literacy level are very low. Uh, but there is a very young population that is very interested in not only in using technology but also in uh, hacking technology, which is uh, kind of uh, interesting. So to, to just to give, uh, I promise to, to, to Mark that I would have given a, an overview, a brief overview of the Brazilian uh, scene. So just to set, so that we are all on the same page, Brazil is a, of course, is a federative go uh, republic presidential system, it means that the president is elected for four years, chooses the ministers, but the law is elaborated by the Congress, whereas the, the, the government uh, steers policy. So uh, what, uh, since the 80s, uh, 70s, Brazil has started to be, uh, as 
tried at least to be autonomous in terms, to have some sort of digital sovereignty, for instance, stimulating the elaboration of, of national uh, computer uh, uh, developer COBRA, the Computer Brasileiros, uh, to develop uh, national hardware. Uh, and that this became a little bit unsustainable when Brazil joined GATT and, uh, and uh, WTO in the 90s uh, and uh, in the 2000s the market was open and it really not became sustainable to privilege national products when uh, uh, foreign products were more performing and, uh, and actually also uh, much cheaper. Um, the, with regard to uh, uh, data protection and cybersecurity, which are the themes I guess we are going to discuss. Uh, the, uh, those are, have been themes really dear to the Brazilian government and spe specifically in foreign policy. Uh, Brazil, together with Germany, was in 2013 the main sponsor of the famous, uh, the famous uh, recommendation on uh, the privacy in the digital uh, age, uh, but at the same time there was this paradox of having, of being, uh, having uh, Dilma Rousseff uh, lobbying for more privacy abroad, also primarily due to the, to the Snowden revelation that directly targeted the Brazilian and the German government, uh, but also uh, having a, an, a country that does not have a data protection legislation at home. Uh, this has been uh, discussed for almost uh, nine years uh, and finally it has been approved uh, in, uh, in August uh, but not approved but a little bit mutilated. <laughs> so the, the, the reason why I mentioned before that uh, it's a presidential system is that uh, also to let you understand that although the, the, the legislation is developed by the Congress then the final word the one who puts the signature is the president and that can also veto some norms. Uh, so for instance, the, the current framework that will enter, it's not really even current, the one that has been uh, adopted but will enter in, in, in force in 2020, in February, uh, has, been, the, the, has been, some provisions are, have been sanctioned, so not signed by the president. And those are some critical provisions. For instance, the creation of, uh, of uh, uh, Data Protection Authority, which is essential to interpret the norms, uh, it uh, has been sanctioned. And so far, it has been promised that uh, a, a, an authority would have been created. This authority is mentioned 50 times in the, in, in, in the law to make you understand that it's critical for the implementation of the law uh, and for the in, in implementation and also the, the, uh, the correct interpretation, not only implementation. Uh, the uniform interpretation. It, there, in Brazil, it's a wide area with uh, wide, with very di diverse thinking in terms of juridical thinking, and so you may understand that this kind of law, if interpreted in different ways, uh, may lead to several judicial problems. Uh, the lack of this uh, authority uh, really, uh, at least, makes us question how efficient would be this law, and really lowers down the enthusiasm for having this new law, knowing that it's, it, it is highly, uh, so far, it is highly unlikely that it will be correctly implemented. Uh, just to finish uh, a couple of words with regard to cybersecurity, uh, there is uh, the, the reason also why uh, uh, the uh, cybersecurity framework uh, is um, not really, uh, well, let's say it's not, not really the best practice where you can find. Uh, is I, I think on the one hand, uh, it doesn't really uh, is not a deterrent for people that want to uh, to, for instance, invade another system because the the the, the, the you, you the fine you may have is imprisonment from three to twelve months, which is not really deterrent if you know that you may gain in uh, with a single cyber attack. Uh, sufficient money for, uh, I don't know, five e living five years, and if you have a, an, an honest job, we, you, will f you will find, uh, you will gain pr probably two or three thousand, uh, sorry, two or three hundred dollars per month. So it's not really a deterrent. On the other hand, uh, you have, uh, the reason why I'm saying that is not really the best practice you can have is that the majority of the cybersecurity apparatus is coordinated by the military. So it's, uh, although this has been 
a necessity, let's say, due to the series of mega events Brazil had to face and they had to implement this kind of, uh, at least some kind of uh, digital defense uh, mechanism, uh, there is, uh, I, in my opinion, there is not a sufficient overview from civil society bodies and from the, uh, the legislature that uh, should uh, have more uh, more overview and more and a higher possibility to assess uh, not only which kind of activities are are uh, are enacted but also how they are they are implemented. And with this, I just uh, I close my initial remarks and let you moderate. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, it was very interesting how you recalled that Brazil made a big push for national national production of computers for a while there. Uh, and that kind of fizzled out. But now I think that the country is making a big comeback in terms of software. We see a lot of development on that field. So it does seem that even though that hardware side of it did go a little, you know, under, uh, it is very promising on the software side. Um, to continue our exposition, I would like to follow the BR order. Um, we have Ilona Stadnik, she is the co-proposer of this panel, actually, has been an incredible, invaluable help. She is an internet government researcher, PhD candidate at the St. Petersburg State University, and currently a visiting researcher at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Ilona, if you could give us a little bit of an exposition about what the Russian views are, please. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Um, well, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, economic uh, uh, dimension because uh, I think everyone in the room uh, is pretty much well known about these Russian cyber powers, especially offensive ones. But actually, I want to draw attention to what is happening inside the country regarding the digital economy, the digital policies uh, like in the whole, because I think it's pretty much... Um, uh, escaped in the mass media and the coverage of this outside of our country. So basically, uh, I, I must say that uh, the government was not so pretty much interested in internet until uh, 2010, 10 or 11. Uh, well, uh, there were different triggers for that. Uh, I want, I, I don't want to stop here, but. Um, uh, since 2011, 12, 13, 14, governments started to elaborate some laws regarding the data protection. So we were uh, even uh, pioneers maybe uh, b before the GDPR uh, emergence in protecting the personal data of uh, our citizens, the digital data. But maybe that was the worst thing because uh, our regulation is not so perfect still. Um, but uh, until 2015, uh, there was no kind of digital economy uh, topic uh, inside the government. And uh, on that year, we have a big conference called Internet Economy, and uh, it was kind of a signal because the, uh, among the attendants, there were our president, President Putin, and he literally said that now it's time for government to think how to regulate the digital economy in order not to be left behind the, um, the most developed countries because uh, internet has a very big potential for economic development. And since that year, uh, we have established the Institute of Internet Development. Uh, basically, it was a platform for um, for people from the industry who is inside the topic of different sectors. Uh, and uh, there was a dialogue between them and the government authorities in order to elaborate steps what should be done in different sectors. And so the next year, 2016, we have a plenty of conferences. So basically they were uh, designed like this. They were called Internet Plus and then Plus Sovereignty, plus uh, medicine, plus uh, education, plus uh, smart city, plus um, finance, plus, uh, plus, um, med uh, plus media. And the outcome of all these events, they also get uh, industry and government people who is responsible for these areas, uh, was the creation of the national program called Digital Economy. Uh, it was uh, started in 2017, 
Uh, we uh, also established a special uh, autonomous non-commercial uh, organization called Digital Economy 2. And it was very unique uh, in its creation because uh, basically it was pr pretty much multi-stakeholder. Um, so the main idea was that uh, uh, this uh, organization, uh, it has um, several, uh, several fields. It was um, staff and education, information infrastructure, information security, um, research and development, uh, some regulative normative practices, and uh, regional policies. So these uh, developments were curated by, um, by special groups that were comprised of uh, business, big businesses, and uh, representatives from the government. So basically they were, uh, so the business was uh, defining the strategy, how this uh, uh, national uh, program should be implemented, and uh, the government on its side was just uh, approving what should be done and uh, um, process the actual regulation. Uh, still, the developments are undergoing. And uh, for, the, for this year, for 2018, uh, the government leveraged the, um, the status of the program. Now it's national wide. And it causes uh, some drawbacks, actually, because uh, now the government said that business done its part, it's okay, we define the strategy, we define what should be done, but now we should uh, turn the, uh, we should uh, pass the harness to government, to, uh, to ministries, uh, in order to coordinate how the budget funds should go for the realization of the program and also how the uh, external investment should be also spent on this. And now um, our uh, expert community said that business is kind of don't understand what's going on and what is his role now. Um, but still, um, we have a, a pretty interesting novelty. Now each ministry should have its own uh, chief digital officer who will be responsible for implementing this national digital economy uh, program. Maybe I should start, uh, stop here because we have also other questions regarding the data security and data protection. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Alona. I think that it's very refreshing to hear uh, about the Russian perspective not coming strictly from what we usually hear in the media. This is actually very valuable information, especially considering uh, cooperation. Um, it is quite, I must admit from the outside, it looks very complex. So I think that this sort of debate, it does help a lot in us trying to approach a little more this reality. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, carrying on, we would like to um, asked very uh, historic person, uh, very big CV. I'll try to summarize the, the key points. Uh, Dr. Govind uh, worked, is a working expert in internet governance and served as the CEO of the National Internet Exchange of India and has a very vast um, history in positions in the Department of IT and has also been a key player in the deployment of DOT uh, IN, and it's a, an IPv6 deployment and all sorts of good things for the internet that you can imagine. So it's a great pleasure to receive you here, Dr. Govind, if you could give us a few words about India. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak in this big panel. I would like to take you to the India's stance on the digital footprints in the country in the sense that India is very much enshrined into the Digital India program for making digital infrastructure as a utility to every citizen, governance and services on demand and digital empowerment of citizens. Some numbers, like we have a 1.5 billion mobiles right now in the country. We have 1.2 billion unique identification number, which we have enshrined, as the name is Aadhaar, which is called. We have a 500 million internet users, second only after the China. And we have, this year, not yet completed, we have more than 1,000 million transactions, online transactions on various services 
digital transactions and those kind of things. So you can imagine the kind of numbers which are gaining year by year and the push the government is giving to the digital empowerment, digital transactions, digital infrastructure. The mission which is enshrined is the e-governance for empowering citizens, promoting the inclusive and sustainable growth of the electronics, IT, ITES services. India is the main software provider, the global software provider for the various uh, companies. More than three-fourths of the Fortune 500 companies have a footprint in India. Enhancing India's role in the global internet governance discussions, adopting a multi-pronged approach that includes development of human resources, promoting R&D, innovation, enhancing efficiency through the digital services and ensuring a secure cyberspace. So you can see that, you know, how the government is working and now we don't want to miss the digital revolution unlike the industrial revolution we missed earlier. So government has realized that the digital, reaching out through digital means is the only means now to reach out to the have-nots are in the population of the country, which is a huge number. Digital India is an umbrella program to prepare India for the, for the knowledge-based transformation. It weaves together a huge number of ideas and thoughts into a single comprehensive vision so that each of them is seen as a part of the larger goal. So all kinds of ministries have got together, whether it is agriculture, finance, the industry, farmers, legal, so that they, we have a very comprehensive program within the country to work towards the digital program. The focus of Digital India program is on transmart, transformative to realize IT Indian talent plus IT information technology which is equal to India tomorrow. And we think uh, this is the future of the India, you know. The Indian talent plus information technology is the way forward for the India to move forward in the future of the internet and the digital world. The program pulls together many existing schemes that I, will, I have already talked about you. The vision is to digital infrastructure as a utility to every citizen, governance and services on demand, digital empowerment of the citizens through financial empowerment and social empowerment. We have launched many program, I will not go into the detail, like Digital India, Make in India for manufacturing part of the country, like today half, more than 50% of the mobiles are produced within the country, unlike it was earlier, most of them were imported. Skill development, stand up India, start up India. I think India is, Bangalore is becoming the third largest startup uh, hub for the startup industry. Smart cities, online registration systems, or for all the hospitals and other utilities. Coming to this few words on the cyber security initiative, because cyber security is an important element of the entire digital program. Security of cyberspace, and we have realized that social media have emerged as one of the important public communication channels. It brings social groups together in a virtual space of interaction in real time. So we have a national, enshrined the national cyber security policy 2013 framework for enhancing cybersecurity, information technology act which we enshrined way back in 2000 and we, a modified version came in 2008. And certain computer emergency response team is there in when placed, national critical information infrastructure is there, cyber law comprehensive legal framework is there to you know tackle any kinds of situation like best practices and guidelines to do prevent occurrences and recurrence of security incidents, section 43A and 70B, protection of critical information infrastructure, section 70A, effective deterrence provisions, section 43, 43A, 66, 66B, 66F, 72 and 72A, in terms of compensation and punishment to deal with cyber crime, such as cyber terrorism, online pornography, including child pornography, criminal act using computer, identity theft, cheating by personation, violation of privacy, breach of confidentiality and privacy, breach of lawful contract, etc. So we have put a in frame and we have recently regarding the data protection and privacy, we have a, this year we brought in the personal data protection bill, which mm -hmm. is going to be placed in the parliament 
in the in the in the coming months which is which is well laid how the data has to be preserved how the data has to be of course there is a, some controversy regarding data localization whether it should be placed within the country or it should be outside the country so it is pros and cons a multi stakeholder approach government is consulting the private industry and the civil society and the on the other parts to see that what is the best for the country to bring this this kind of thing we have a collaboration with the within the brick countries uh, like russia china and others do you know on the various joint working groups are made to tackle the issues of cyberspace and many other fields of the technological transport agriculture and those fields are already there so and we have a kind of uh, uh, cert activities which is there for taking the incidents uh, noting about 69000 incidents handled security alerts are 55 advisories are there and cert has a regional collaboration with asia pacific cert and the carnegie mellon cert and so many other certs around the world so that we are cooperating with those kind of thing so and we have a cooperation through bilateral interaction with the other countries uh, many of the countries of the world in this space i think i will stop here thank you thank you very much dr govin um i think that one very powerful message that i outline here in my notes is not to miss the digital revolution i i think that is a key message that um most of the brick countries should really be keeping in mind how do we not miss the digital revolution and you outline some very interesting points especially the mobile penetration which i know is also speaking from the brazilian perspective is growing immensely um maybe the mobile is one of the vectors we will reach the the digital literacy but it does feel a little incomplete sometimes so this is something for us to think about and maybe discuss in our round table later um last but definitely not least um we have the our representative for the C which is Yi Chan she's assistant professor at the Hong Kong Baptist University and working there as a media and communication politics um she kindly agreed to share a few impressions with us and it will be a pleasure to has see to hear what she has to say so please Yi if you may Okay, thank you, uh, Mark. Uh, actually, I uh, now I I moved to China. I work in the Xi'an Jiao Tong New University in Suzhou, nearby Shanghai. Just to clarify that, so I think today is my uh, my top the topic I want to touch on uh, is about the cyber sovereignty. You know, um, the issue of cyber sovereignty has been a core argument put forward by the Chinese government. So that is also general concern for international debate. So that's why I want to touch on this. I think there's a cyber point I want to make, you know. First of all, I think uh, why people concern so concerned about the claim of cyber sovereignty. I think that's a uh, uh, because cyber sovereignty actually usually is placed against uh, for example like uh, inter internet connectivities, interconnectivities and about the human rights freedom expressions, you know, uh, uh, because this is kind of concept actually is uh, looks uh, against the the claim of cyber sovereignty. And the other one is about uh, people think the cyber sovereignty actually is kind of the multilateral you know uh, governance norm rather than multi stakeholder model <laughs> so that's a concern about uh, the model for multilateral governance and multi stakeholder governance so this is the general uh, debate about the cyber sovereignty issues uh, but uh, the, this kind of position i think there are some several issues the first one is about the issue of content content regulations so how to uh, how the government national government uh, regulated the content you know prevent the uh, harms and protect people's right the second one is about uh, uh, we know there's a imbalance of power in terms of the internet governance and the international law and the cyber sp space negotiation there's a small country and the big countries for example like china usa or the european union so where there's a small country like africa as latin america so uh, what what is the best model for them to participate in in cyber space negotiation so multilateral model probably is the one which could facilitate the small countries uh, government uh, as we understand the multilateral models uh, uh, points and cons and uh, but uh, i have to point out of course uh, cyber sovereignty sometimes can abuse 
by national government to, to stiff the freedom of expression, to repress the freedom of expression, you know, to contain the information flow in their domestic countries. So, uh, so therefore, I think uh, uh, at the moment, uh, how can we uh, place the cyber security or cyber sovereignty uh, issue put forward? The main question, I think, is not about whether we should uh, totally reject cyber space sovereignty. Uh, no matter you uh, accept it or not, this is a fact. Even the uh, President Macron, you know, the two days uh, ago, they made a speech, so uh, explicitly recognized uh, the government's role in, in, in internet governance. So I think the main point is not about an uh, entirely reject concept, but it's about the jurisdiction of cyberspace sovereignty. Wh which areas belong to the government's uh, regulation, which is not. So, and in China, I think at the moment, there, there's a debate uh, going on. So the main point, I think domestic, I'm not talking about, uh, on behalf of the government, I'm talking on behalf of the academics and also uh, like uh, social organizations. I think the, 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 so what they propose actually is a kind of three-dimensional approach. So basically when we talk about uh, uh, cyber sovereignty, so it has to be clarified, divided into three levels, three dimension. The first dimension is about the infrastructure. So the second one is about uh, uh, applicational, uh, applicational level. The last one is about the core level. So they call it as a three-dimensional uh, model of uh, cyber sovereignty. So for the first level, uh, they're talking about the infrastructure, as we say, you know, hardware, software, uh, like a standardization, the code. The standard has to be standardization in, in, in order for the internet to be interconnectivities and interoperationalized. So this is the infrastructure. I think a domestically Chinese scholars and uh, NGOs, they support this kind of three dimension. So that's why I want to give you a brief explanation of that. And the second one is about the uh, educational life. We have a lot of apps, you know. Most of the company, they develop apps. Of course, they want to have a global present. It's not like Alipay or WeChat. They do not only want to uh, be used and uh, adapt in China. Of course, they want to have an international market. So, uh, so therefore, how can we uh, make the, uh, you know, uh, make the, uh, to, to be global or compatible? Compatible is another issue. But of course, at the application level, that's something uh, has to be uh, within, sit within the domestic law, for example, like a content privacy law, you know. Uh, privacy law is part of the domestic law, you know. Uh, of course, they have an international implication, but mostly uh, privacy law, you know, uh, has to be national uh, jurisdictions. And also, like, uh, uh, as I said, like other things, maybe it's also uh, within, uh, within the national government's jurisdictions, like uh, the top level domain names. Okay, the last one, I think, is the crucial one. It's called the, they call the core level, which in, uh, involves like a cyber security, uh, the political systems, the political stability, social order, cultural diversity. And then in here, the Chinese opinion standing point is that the government, the domestic government, has to be a lead. The state has to meet. And uh, so the, 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 the public policy, uh, cyberspace public policy making power, has to be received and the local government. Uh, uh, because for various reasons, because we, they, they, we have to respect the diversity, political diversity, cultural diversity, and economic diversity of each, each different countries. And uh, so I think that is the position of Chinese uh, I'm not saying him on behalf of government. I think the domestic uh, like NGO civil society's point of view. Uh, and uh, I think the last one, we, we, when we talk about uh, cyber sovereignty, so we have to make a reference to the United Nations experts. Uh, there's a team of experts. They put forward this definition. They say that basically cyberspace uh, public policy power is a country's sovereignty. So this is a sovereignty, you know. And the country has a sovereignty over it is public space policy making power. And also it has a jurisdiction uh, in terms of uh, the information which is disseminated in the local infrastructures. So I think this is the basic consent. And now over that, as I said, uh, we have to really, you know, debate and define the clearly what is the cyber sovereignty and uh, what is the jurisdictions belong to the national government, what is should be uh, belong to the international, you know, uh, law or international negotiations. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you greatly, Yik. Uh, I think that you touch upon many points that are of great interest. In, in particular, this three-dimensional approach, I think, kind of summarizes 
uh, in a bit of a neat way um, what the policy may look like. I, I myself have to look further into it. I, I'll admit that I was not so aware of it. So this is a, a very interesting point to start off. So thank you very much. Um, with this initial exposition, um, I would like to propose, and this is tentative, um, let's try your best, uh, to have a debate between the, the, the people present here. Because we do identify one specific thing when we look at BRIC countries, which is the rate of cyber attacks. All of the BRIC countries fall within the top 10 of the Akamai list of cyber attackers. This, to me, when I, w I was initially coming up to th with, with this panel, together with Ilona, this strikes to us something very interesting. From one side, you can look at it, you know, these countries are dangerous, cyber dangerous, but there's an opposite message there, which is these countries have very skilled, talented people, very interested in the digital, who have a high capacity output that is maybe not being used in the correct way, but can't that capacity be leveraged for them to become cyber giants? Can this capacity be used for the betterment of society? So I would like to propose a little bit that we get into what we feel is, are some indicators that we could look at to move this conversation forward. In, in my mind, I think a lot about education and how, are this, this new how is this new generation being educated in terms of cyber, what they, are they taking? I also think a lot of job markets, how are the job markets structured? Do people who want to find good jobs in the cyber have that, that, that access? But I, I would be very pleased to hear from my panelists and as we move from our audience as well, what do you think are some key points that we should be looking at in approaching this from a policy perspective? How do we get these people who produce so much, uh, such a huge volume of cyber attack to produce a huge volume, even huger volume of good quality software, hardware, and become real digital, you know, top actors. So I would like to know if any uh, ambassador, Benedicto from Brazil. Thank you. Well, I'd like to, first of all, to uh, thank the panelists and yourself for this uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Benedicto Fonseca. I'm from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Uh, just uh, a more a comment uh, in general, uh, more than uh, uh, responding to your call, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, we, I think we missed the presentation from South Africa because we should be talking not of BRIC, but of BRICS, since South Africa is also there. And uh, the second part of the title that also strikes me, uh, you have already addressed that, is when you say a brick hit the web, it seems like the brick are attacking the web. And, uh, but you have already, I think, put in a very proper context. Uh, thank you for that. But I'd like just to uh, complement the presentation that was made by Luca Belli in regard to some developments that have taken place in Brazil recently. First of all, uh, referring to data protection, it was, uh, uh, as rightly said, it was uh, enacted, sanctioned by our president on 14th August, so it's over exactly uh, three months ago. And the National Data Protection Authority, the provisions on the National Data Protection Authority, they were vetoed, not sanctioned. I think the transcription maybe got it wrong. They were vetoed, not sanctioned. I think it was a mistake. Yeah, in the there, there was a mistake there. And the reason for that is that that uh, portion of the law was proposed by Congress, and according to our legislation, it should be the initiative of the executive power. So that's the reason why it was vetoed. But the president, at the same time, announced that there would be complementary legislation for that, because otherwise, it, as it was said, it would be mutilated. Actually, it would make no sense to have a legislation without the implementing power for that. <coughs> Uh, in, in anticipation of our participation and of the National uh, Data Protection Authority to be put in place, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has already made a request of observer status and this has been granted uh, before the Consultative Committee of Convention 108 of the European Parliament that allows for National Data Protection Authority to meet and share 
best practices and explore uh, possibilities of cooperation. This is something we uh, have done in anticipation of, unfortunately we have not yet the complementary legislation on national data protection, but the good news is that this legislation will become legally enforceable only in 18 months. That's exactly what happened in the case of the GDPR, in the case of the European Union. So not before uh, February 2020, there is an expectation of the legislation to be, so I, I think there is still time for, for this national data protection authority to, to, to be put into effect and to be able to perform as soon as the legislation will become enforceable. Uh, and uh, the second point in regard to cyber security, it is true that there is a cert that is hosted by government and hosted by the military, but the most important cert in Brazil is hosted by the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, multi stakeholder body. Actually, I, I've seen around many people from the CERT participate in the meetings, so I, I'm not sure it is uh, quite right to say that cybersecurity is coordinated or led by the military. Of course, there is a military dimension of cybersecurity, including cyber defense, that needs to be taken over by government. But uh, the, the civilian CERT, is, if I can so, hosted by CGI, is the most active and uh, important in Brazil and has, by the way, a very wide network of uh, uh, interaction with CERT worldwide. So those are just a few points I'd like to raise uh, for, to enrich the debate. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your clarifications, Ambassador. Uh, they have been taken note. And I would like to ask if um, any of our panelists uh, would like to intervene on, on the subject. Um, please, Luca, you have the floor. Yeah, of course. My, uh, I thank you also, uh, Ambassador Benedicto, for the clarifications. Of course, my initial overview was just about uh, governmental policy, so I was not digging into the parallel uh, system that was created in actually in 95 with uh, decree the CGI then also uh, further uh, redeveloped in 2003 by President Ignacio Lula da Silva uh, defining the current structure of the CGI which also encompasses uh, the CERT uh, which is an imp incredibly important uh, uh, entity of course uh, what I was uh, trying to, uh, to, to highlight was the, uh, let's say, the divergence between the uh, very progressive uh, uh, foreign policy that Brazil has been pushing for over the past uh, couple of decades and uh, some elements that were missing uh, at, at home. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, the, first the first example was the data protection legislation that was only recently enacted. And I'm, I'm not sure everyone shares the uh, optimistic view that in the next 15 months uh, and that protection authority will be uh, created and able for not, on, not only created but also able to uh, perform, for instance, a, a key point that to facilitate data protection and also competition is the uh, right to data portability, right to, just, just an example, right to export your data and go to a competitor. Uh, but that is only possible when uh, an, a, 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 an administrative authority, the, uh, the administrative authority yet to be created, defines the norms on, on how to do so. So that the reason why may, perhaps my, my, my term mutilated for, was a little bit too, uh, too uh, uh, um, folkloric and too uh, harsh but uh, it was really to communicate the fact that without the uh, authority p existing and properly functioning, the current legis I, my personal opinion is that the current legislative uh, framework, uh, it would be very difficult to implement. I, very, I hope in the next 15 months uh, this body will be created and will be able to operate. It's my greatest hope, but I'm not sure every observer uh, has shares the same optimism. Uh, I, I wanted to, to make another comment with regard to what was said before uh, on the production of a lot of software 
and uh, that also is linked to the uh, very progressive uh, policy that also were enacted by the Lula government, not only creating this, this uh, multi-stakeholder uh, makeup of the CGI and further empowering the CGI, but also uh, lobbying and implementing free software uh, uh, policies in Brazil, and I think are responsible for the, great, uh, for the great development of software nowadays. The fact that this was not only uh, allowed Brazil not to be dependent from foreign software, to diminish, but also to limit costs and to enhance cybersecurity paradoxically because with open source software that you can, uh, that is transparent, you can, uh, you can examine, you know if there are vulnerabilities, if you are dependent from a pri pri uh, pri private software that is uh, uh, provided by a foreign company and is proprietary and you cannot inspect it, you cannot know if there are vulnerabilities and if those are, are uh, then find, found out by hackers, you, are, you can only be victim of the hackers. So just, just a, a brief comment. Uh, in the spirit of not keeping the conversation to Brazil focused, I would like our other um, panelists to please, um, Ilona, if you may. Well, I would like to return to the issue that you raised before you opened the floor regarding the trend that there are a lot of ne negative potential uh, in countries for making cybercrime. So uh, Russia really likes the idea of promoting the culture of, global, of, of cyber security. What it means? Basically, uh, on the national level, uh, it is about education, actually. So there are a lot of efforts, like uh, on the governmental level and on the level of different um, uh, non-commercial organizations, and also, uh, I think uh, that our um, coordination center for the Russian top-level domain also participates in this. Uh, so basically, they uh, provide some um, events uh, aimed at uh, school, peer, school children. Um, it's kind of a lesson of how to behave in, on the internet, how to behave safely, how to manage your passwords, how not to be um, tricked by uh, criminals and all of this stuff. But also, um, there is another trend. Um, we have a very huge uh, brain, uh, brain drain from our country of, of the specialists that are specializing in cybersecurity, information security. Of course, our uh, country is trying to do something with this. Um, we have pretty competitive uh, big players uh, on the cybersecurity markets. They provide uh, big uh, offers, big salaries, but it's still not enough. Uh, another track is that our government is recruiting people for this service, for, for a FSB uh, service, for some intelligence service. But uh, the problem that is that um, the uh, conditions for work is not so uh, good for people who actually get used to freedom. That's why we still have uh, lacking the specialist in cybersecurity field. Um, another point I want to raise is that um, also our government is aimed at uh, stopping the uh, dependency on the imported software. Of course, we have a lot of uh, good developers of software applications, for software programs, but still um, the majority of software that is used in country coming abroad. And so it is kind of uh, viewed as a pretty much very, um, very big hazard for, for the national security, especially f uh, for the systems that uh, is operating at the governmental level. So we are working on substituting this imported software with the national created one. But still, uh, this initiative was uh, pushed forward uh, like two or three years ago, but still the progress is not so big. Uh, I wonder, coming from that point, Dr. Govind, um, you did mention in uh, the aspect of development within India and we also know that India has been exporting a lot of brains around the world in the cyber realm. Um, do you have uh, a position to give us as to what the situation is right now on, in terms of how this is being shaped at this moment? How uh, is the local industry, is it growing? Do you, how, what is your view for the local industry of India, not only for the people that ha it has been able to export around the world? Uh, thank you. The, uh, yeah, I would like to say that, you know, India 
the globally the Indian software, the India developed the they may not be the Indians working abroad like Sundar Pichai in the the Google and the many of the big CEOs of the big companies of the U.S. are the in, full of Indians working on various softwares. So, having said that, we have a lot of software pools within the country, TCS, Wipro, Infosys, which are working for the software development from the global companies within the country. And we are safeguarding the software because it, it's a, it's a, in the internet world, you cannot de demarcate between the, your own country versus the rest of the world kind of thing, you know. It's a free flow of information which has to go. So believe me that in the democratic way of things doing in this multi-stakeholder approach in the internet governance approach. So as far as the software concerned, we are aware that certain software comes with the bugs in the equipments, in the telecom equipments and in the software. So we need to take care, maybe the local expertise to see that what kind of equipment we are importing and what kind of exporting, what kind of things are embedded in that. So we, are, we make it aware that how these things, and apart from that, the cybersecurity, the issues, the cybersecurity things which are there, we make the awareness in the country to the grassroots levels, in the women, the cyber stacking areas, in the root server areas. So the massive programs are there as the digital footprint I talked to you in the beginning. There is a simultaneous cyber awareness, hygiene, cyber safe, cyber, safe cyber security kind of things are also there. But we are in a world where, you know, these things keep happening, what I believe. You can't completely isolate a country from the, you know, the software and the hardware because it's an import and export and all kinds of ideas are moving around. So as the AI is coming, you know, like the blockchains are coming or the new technologies are coming. So how will you tackle that? Because the blockchain is completely opaque to the external world. Today, it's not internet. It is a blockchain. So how the blockchain will see the privacy, the blockchain versus privacy, blockchain versus security. So how will you deal with the next level of new emerging technologies which are coming up? So we have to see that the ethical part of the blockchain, ethical part of the artificial intelligence. So these are the things which needs lot of discussion, debates globally, the, how we tackle these new technologies when come, the, the multinationals, how they are dealing, how to distinguish between the local needs, local ethnicity, local culture, multicultural language, like India has a 22 official languages. India has a multicultural, every state has its own culture, food, you know, cultural habits and everything. So how do you preserve in the internet these kinds of things should not get wiped out. So we are seeing that how these things can, be, internet is a great enabler at the same time. So you can propagate your things as well as you can see the, how the harms are done, how we can prevent those kind of things. So you have to have a double kind of, is a, is a weapon. In India, internet is a double-edged weapon. You know, you, you, you have to, if you are getting good things, you will get the bad things also. So, but how to prevent, how to, you should be aware how, where the, bad things are happening and how to prevent that through the global cooperation in the cybersecurity era, multilateral dialogues in the UN and the other places. How do you work with the, like BRIC, we are working with the Russia, other countries within the BRIC, how to build the trust, more cooperation in the cyberspace so that we utilize, and certain principles we have to build. Look, these are the slate where we work, if something happens to this state, we can, we have to go back and we have to improve that. So that way we can increase the cooperation because with the borderless medium like internet, you cannot have a, a national things and those kind of things. That's what I believe. Thank you. Thank you very much for the intervention. I believe we have an intervention from the floor. I would just like to ask if there's any questions on the online queue as well. Perfect, so we go to the floor. The gentleman, please. Uh, I'm. Uh Siva Subramanian Muthuswamy from Internet Society India, Chennai, and also from the Dynamic Coalition on Core Internet Values. Between the countries, um, uh, the workshop talks about common positives and common negatives, and the prominent common negative that uh, is repeatedly talked about is cyber security issues, which are uh, more politicized than actual. The threats are real, but 
they are exaggerated and politicized by uh, for various reasons uh, by everyone so can 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 the can the focus be on sharing more uh, more of uh, positives on positive policies india has several good policies and good practices to share for example the work that it does on digital india transformation and uh, uh, on uh, other uh, developments and uh, brazil for instance uh, is an is an exemplary multi stakeholder uh, uh, um, I mean, has uh, introduced a multi-stakeholder multi process and encourages multi-stakeholder model, model in an exemplary way. And it's also very good on community networks. And between the countries, r rather than waiting for an invitation from one country to another, could uh, these countries with uh, positive experiences and positive policies uh, proactively share uh, their good practices and good experiences like Brazil could reach out to other countries and uh, not only within BRICS but to other countries and then talk about uh, their experience of community networks and multi-stakeholder process and uh, make a positive, positive uh, participation in internet and internet governance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. I've, I believe that one of the things that we set out to do is really understand, get a basic consensus going. In, in this forum, for instance, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is the only brick oriented workshop we've had. Maybe it's true. So it's still an area of discussion that needs to be very, there needs to be a, a whole more, more diving, a whole lot more space for communication. And with the linguistic diversity, the cultural diversity, I do believe that we have to make like more proactive efforts to get this sort of conversation going. Hopefully our very basic um, attempt at doing this manages to advance this to some degree. I would like to know if any of the panelists would like to intervene on that. Uh, Yik, please, you have the floor. Yes, thank you for the question. I think this is a very reasonable and uh, questions. And uh, I think, uh, uh, we, I think among the BRIC country, we're not only talking about cyber security for sure, you know, and um, as many of my colleagues mentioned, you know, uh, each of these countries uh, try to develop their software as well as like uh, data protections, uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain, you know. Um, I think the crucial, uh, crucial issue for the country who are trying to catch up uh, because you know China and America, they are raising about uh, artificial intelligence, you know, big data, so all these things. I think, uh, uh, but if you look at the, 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 the recent accidents happened in China, the, 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 the trade war, the, the crash of the, you know, the, between the accu accusation of the cyber attack. So a lot of issues touch about uh, who controls what. Uh, for example, like uh, infrastructure controls and as your intellectual property rights, you know, the software de dependence. So, uh, therefore, you know, for many of, even for China, you know, uh, I think they are facing a kind of issue about uh, how can they develop their own software uh, as well as the hardware and, uh, and also the IP right issue. So, you know, even the artificial intelligence seems quite popular and uh, the governments put a lot of money and efforts to developing the artificial intelligence and research and infrastructure and uh, software and companies. But we have to be aware that in almost 80 to 90 percent of the algorithm, you know, actually was developed in the U.S. And uh, uh, if, if you look at the artificial intelligence, China was good at what? Applications. Okay, they, 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 they do not have their own independent algorithms. And most of the algorithms they, they copy it or emulate from the U.S. The source is based on U.S. Uh, the innovations, so they just uh, use it uh, in terms of the applications. I think uh, so, so there are a lot of the, in terms of facial recognitions, language translations. So if you look at all these applications, they're based on the algorithm developed in the U.S. So for, for countries like uh, developing country or the countries who try to catch up, we think we, we need to think about all these things, particularly in terms of artificial intelligence, you know. So it's all not only, only that's a small, that's a crucial part, but it's not a whole story. Yeah. Thank you very much, Hik. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, 
we will have to start wrapping the session up. Maybe we can fit a final comment in or any reaction. So, um, Dr. Luca, please. Just a comment to uh, complain what uh, Siva was saying. Uh, that we are, I mean, we are not really only focusing on cybersecurity here. It was just one facet of the workshop. And actually, uh, I think that, uh, I mean, although as I mentioned before, one may have a critical view, and I think it's good to have critical, positive criticism, for instance, on data protection framework that have been uh, adopted or are going to be adopted by BRICS. There are a lot of interesting elements that could be shared and I think what I mean if we want if as an academic I'm used to analyze best practices and worst practices so there are things that should be reproduced from other people's experiences and things that should not be reproduced so both in the process that people are adopting and both in the in the substance there are things that one can criticize as good or, or bad uh, and what I think is BRICS are starting to understand now is that, is that simply copying and pasting what mm -hmm. Europe has done or US have done doesn't really solve the problem. If BRICS have to find their own solutions, and the reason why actually I was mentioning before the open source, the free and open source software as a, as a catalyst for production of software is that this could be a third, a third, a real third solution uh, that uh, does not allow people to depend on other people's software. So it's uh, actually, if the, 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 I think that the, the open software, uh, for, for instance, in the, in, the, in the field of software development, that would be a very good avenue for cooperation. Not only to have improvements in software, but also to be useful to other developing countries. And with that, I would like to maybe summarize. Unfortunately, we do have an incoming session, but I do think that a thread emerged here. It is the thread of software and how these countries are moving forward. We just said this word a lot in different contexts, be it apps or cybersecurity or the companies. And in future discussions that I hope we all have, we can maybe start looking from that angle and see what can be produced in that sense. I would like to thank immensely everyone who came here. It is a great pleasure that you join us for this tentative discussion. And I would like to invite you all to contact the, uh, the panelists if you, if you feel that the, you have anything further to add. We would like to carry this conversation forward in this forum and other forums in the future. And thank you greatly for your presence. Thank you very much.
because my next comment would be the numbers won't tell you everything about this, right? So exactly. your personal experience exactly. will tell a lot too. And which is why I think networking and actually talking to people who go there and take the business will be far more important than the actual data online. Which is why I come to these places rather than well <laughs> Thing is, I am responding to it. You have to have that process sensing general criticism about how to put it out. And that's so I've been intervening in this line for a couple of times. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fair to demand the space to get more concrete outputs, not results, not that. I make is that multilateral models have been there for over 150 years. They have so helped solve a couple of problems, they have failed miserably in others. And yet we haven't lost our faith for this. So why is the basis of the model say for the model? Where is it? Where the same society gets the chance to speak for the first time? After five years since that's why like I think that there's a huge biotone again when it comes to regards to the criticism. And the North, the model has been like, uh, it has been a working model for a couple of years, maybe two decades, right? The guy that gave the ICA, probably 10 years. I think IGF could have been 13 years. It's coming from Latin America. In Latin America, the model has come to be a regional thing. Two years ago, three years ago, there are countries that are organizing their first regional IGF next year. So, forces are not all yet there. So, it's not time to lose. I know it's not. We don't, we don't have the dynamics of 200 years ago. We have to be quicker yeah. in finding a way, but not to lose the patience of the couple of years. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. What you're saying is really interesting. Thank you very much. This is based, I was based for five years in between Brussels, Lisbon, and Lisbon in the States. Now I'm back in Brazil. But,
Maybe there are new people who need one? Excuse me. Okay, so uh, everybody, thank you very much for uh, uh, coming and uh, joining us. Uh, I would like to start the uh, open forum uh, organized by uh, Japanese government and the French government uh, uh, jointly. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, my name is Yoichi Ida, uh, the Deputy Director General.